Uh, for this evening's talk, I just came back this afternoon from overseas and there was an email waiting for me and somebody was asking a, a question and a, making a subject for this evening's talk. In Buddhism we talk a lot about loving kindness and compassion, but how can we use loving kindness and compassion, and they said, for troubled people, and how can we can put boundaries around those troubled people. And it's a very good question because even though Buddhism is regarded as a very compassionate uh, religion or path, it also has to be a wise path as well. There's a, a very old simile in Buddhism of like a bird always has two wings and one wing is compassion, the other one is wisdom. If you only have one of those wings, the bird can never fly. If it does take off, <laughs> it goes around in circles, never gets anywhere. So we always have to balance our compassion with wisdom. And this is a case in point here. We may have some difficulty in life. And uh, that's actually part of life. Life is what is difficult. If life was really easy, there wouldn't be much point taking rebirth as a human being. It's the tests and difficulties which we face on our journey <coughs> between birth and death which actually provide us with the wisdom and the experience to understand what compassion truly is and even to develop our wisdom even deeper. For example, our caretaker Yong was wise enough to know it was still a bit warm in here and also compassionate enough to turn up the fans at the same time. So there you go, there's an example of wisdom and compassion. If he was just compassionate and thought, oh, may all beings be cool, that would not have worked. If he was only wise and he knew how to turn on those fans, that would not have worked. But when you have wisdom and compassion get together, the fans get turned on and every <coughs> everybody gets um, cooled down. But I'm sure there are some people though who are now too cold. And I already see a few people putting blankets around them. <laughs> and so even being kind to one person is actually uh, torturing somebody else. And this is one of the most important parts of compassion. When we practice compassion and kindness it should always be to all beings. It's all beings, not just this person, not just that person, but to all beings. And sometimes when we practice compassion, we have to put every, every stakeholder into the equation. So because of this, because it's to all beings, sometimes that makes life very difficult. How can we actually be kind to all beings? And I think the solution comes in just the way that question was asked, I think I got it right, I may have uh, not remembered the email accurately. They called actually, the some people are called like troubled people. But really I never see that there's actually troubled people. There's always like troubled relationships. So it's not a person is a trouble, because actually when they're, when they're a long way away, they're no trouble at all. That's why there's the old joke, you know, you should, before you, you've got to understand a person, or you're going to be kind, you must always walk, what do you say, walk, a, walk a, ten miles in their shoes to really understand them. And they always joke that that's a very good thing to do, because after ten miles, you're ten miles away and you've got their shoes. <laughs> but when a person's a long way away, of course, it doesn't matter how mean, nasty they are, they're no trouble to you. The only trouble comes when they're right in front of you, or next to you, or they're associating with you. So a troubled person, there's no such thing as a troubled person. There's always the way that some people relate to you, or you relate to the other person. It's always troubled relationships. And it's not just people, because with compassion, <coughs> it's not just people, sometimes things, sometimes life is so-called troublesome, too hot, too cold, sometimes you know, trouble is it, uh, economic problems, health problems, uh, things go wrong in life. So it's not just people, it's just life is sometimes troublesome. 
But with people, you can actually get away from them. That's why I've got a cave in my monastery. Got two doors, I can hide in that cave. I can get away. <coughs> but no matter how deep your cave is, you can never get away from life. And also, you can never get away from one person. You get away from your wife, from your husband, from your friends, from your enemies. The one person you can never get away from in life, obviously, is you. No matter where you go, you take yourself with you. Sometimes that's why people get into alcohol and drugs, just to try and escape from themselves. But of course, it's only a temporary escape, because after a while, you're back there with you again. That's why also sometimes people get so upset at themselves, they can't stand themselves, they even commit suicide. But even then, as a Buddhist, I know that if you go and commit suicide, you commit suicide to try and get away from yourself, and you're still there afterwards. Now, now you're a ghost, so you're still stuck with yourself. <coughs> There's one thing I will let you know in life. You can never escape from you. So if you can't escape from you, what should you do if you know you're troublesome to yourself? It's not you the problem is, it's your relationship with yourself. It's not the economic problem, it's your relationship to that. It's not like a troublesome baby, I think it's a baby in there, or a cat squeaking in the corner over there. It's not the baby over there, it's our relationship to that noise, that's the only difficulty over there. So first of all, let's actually redefine the question. How can you employ metal, put boundaries in troublesome relationships? And those relationships are with other people, with life, or with yourself. And of course, once we redefine it there, it becomes more, imp more easy to see it's not the other person's problem. Because too often we think it's their fault. <coughs> when everybody thinks it's somebody else's thought, fault. That's why we always get conflict in this world. The Palestinians think it's the Israelis' fault. Israelis think it's the Palestinians' fault. The, I don't know, the workers think it's the bankers' fault. The bankers think it's the government's fault. The government thinks, I don't know what the government thinks it's fault. They are oh, the opposition. The government thinks it's the opposition's fault. <laughs> and it's very easy to think that other people are troublesome. Because it's not other people. There's one of Ajahn Chah's favourite stories and this is actually comes from an old uh, story in a Buddhist commentary. Once there was a dog, and the dog had mange. And the dog's skin was so itchy, no matter if it scratched it, the mange, the, the skin disease got worse. That's why sometimes in poor countries you see dogs with no hair. <coughs> so this mangy dog was just having such a lot of suffering and so he decided to run away from the village and live in the forest. So he went in the forest, but they still had the suffering there. So he went actually underwater in the pond, and still his, his, um, his back itched. So then he went under the shade of a tree, then out in the sun, then under a rock. Wherever that dog went, it was always suffering, until it realized it wasn't the village's fault. It wasn't the other dogs, it wasn't the, uh, the forest or the shade or the sun or, or the rocks fault. It was actually carrying around the mange inside of itself. And that's an important thing to remember that it's not your wife's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not the government's fault. It's not the economy's fault. It's not my fault, certainly it's not my fault. <laughs> And it's not your fault either. As we take this thing around with us, it's always our fault. It's a wonderful way of looking at it. The mange is our way we don't have a proper relationship to things. Sometimes in life, you do have to deal with troublesome situations. Now, first of all, when you have a difficult situation, let's not say a difficult person, a difficult situation in life, Sometimes you look at that situation, it may be economic problems. It may be like sort of an itchy throat. It may be like your plane is delayed and cancelled. It's not, that's not the problem. 
The problem is, is always what you do with that, how you relate to that, how you make that work to your advantage. So, <coughs> if I've got an itchy throat and start coughing like this, then people have got much more sympathy for me and they don't ask so many questions when I'm finished. So I actually turn it to my advantage so I can get to bed earlier. Oh, if, if you have an economic problem and you, know, you haven't got so much money, then you can become much more green in your life, be more environmentally friendly. Because when you've got poor, you can't afford the big things, or you can't afford the car. And instead of getting a car because you're too poor, you can get a bicycle, which is not only good for your environment, but also good for your health as well. So even in economic difficult times, you can turn it to your health advantage and other advantages as well. There's so many things we can do. And one thing I've often said here, I told this in Colombo and people really were stunned by it because they never heard this before. You've heard it many times before. If you're in economic problems, what a wonderful advantage that is to downsize and to get a smaller house or apartment or even better, a small monk's cootie, a little hut. Because <coughs> you'll find, number one, it's so much easier to keep clean. The smaller the house, the less room, the less housework. It's brilliant. And also, the smaller your house, the less chance there is of any burglars coming in. They'll take one look at your small house and they think, wow, if that's the size of their house, there's nothing in there. Where do burglars go? The big houses. Anyone's got a big house, there must be big things in there. So you have to have no problem with burglars, and also, one of the most important things, when you have small houses, all the people in those houses, because they're close together physically, they soon come close together emotionally. Big mansions cause so much loneliness in the family. One husband in one room, wife in another room, son in their room, daughter in another room, and even the dog's got its own kennel in the back. So why do we do such things? The big mansions actually separate people. Have you ever noticed why that you know sometimes that kids don't know how to get on with each other or get on with their parents? When you're really stuck together in a small place, you have to get on together. And I've just come back from Sri Lanka. It's you know, quite a big island, but there's so many people in that place, they're all crammed together. So they have to get on with each other. Even though it's actually crazy being driven along those roads. You know, there's so many traffic in there and tractors and, and goats and goodness knows what else goes along the main roads. These are the main highways. But still, you know, people, because they're used to that, they're much more skillful drivers than sort of uh, here in Australia. At least those who are still alive are more skillful drivers. <laughs> they learn to get on together. They're so close together, they have to. So there's no other alternative there. So close proximity towards each other actually, actually is a, a good thing, I think. And sometimes our spread out suburbs, you know, we all know we don't know our neighbours. I think it was actually um, Tim Costello once said, the more people know the neighbours TV show than the neighbours living next door to them. So we really should live in smaller communities so we get to know one another. And that gives us social harmony, social cohesion. So this is just an example there. If it's not sort of the economic downturn which is the problem, it's our relationship to it. And we can do it with loving kindness, embrace it and make the most out of it. Otherwise, we can always carry the mange with us wherever we go, whatever we do. It's not the economic prop downturn that's a problem, it's what we do with it. It's the same we have a difficult person which we ha have to deal with. So, how can you have loving kindness to a difficult person? <coughs> As many people think, if you have loving kindness to them, they never change, and even get worse. But they take advantage of your compassion. And of course, you don't have compassion to the other person. You put compassion towards that relationship which you have. 
And this is what you deal with. It's not them, it's not me, it's just what happens in between us when we're together. So that's where I always put my loving kindness, in that space between me and that bastard over there, whatever it is. I like to use the local language, please don't get shocked. So, and I didn't point to anyone over there, I wasn't looking. <laughs> it could be over there as well. It's not particular, it's just an example. But you know, there's sometimes some difficult people in life. A good example of this is, you know that's many years ago, this is part of the history of Bodhinyana Monastery. We had a huge problem with clay trucks past our monastery. It was noisy, but and that wasn't the main problem, as I keep on mentioning. It was the danger of those huge trucks with trailers down that steep, narrow road. And once I saw one of those trailers tip over, they lost control. And I saw that, and that was very scary. So I knew if any one of you were come to visit our monastery, or a monk was visiting the monastery, or going, I was coming and going, if we'd have been in front of that truck, you'd have no chance, you'd be dead. So because of that I thought we'd have to actually fight, this, this is wrong. But I was very um, impressed with the secretary of the time, it was actually Ajahn Sujata, because during all this time, little court cases and legal sort of wranglings, because you know, I had to get to that. But during this whole time, it came to Christmas, and our secretary wrote Christmas cards. Happy Christmas, may you have a wonderful new year, to all our adversaries. That really sort of uh, shook them and undermined what they thought of us. If you're having a legal case with someone and you send someone a Christmas card, they think, my goodness, what's going on here? <coughs> I think it even got told off, I think, because we're only supposed to legally contact our adversaries through our lawyers. We should have sent the Christmas card to our lawyer, we are given it to their lawyer, we are then given it to the adversary. <laughs> crazy system, we just sent it straight to them. So that, even actually your adversaries, you're actually giving some loving kindness, because we realised it was our, it's a common problem, it was our problem, so we have to work together somehow or other, even during a, a legal battle, you know, no ill will, but we had to put some boundaries around this, because we thought this was wrong, and this was going to cause injury if it carried on. So, Whenever you practice loving-kindness, it doesn't mean that you sort of allow other people to do what they want, or you just give in. It is our problem. The relationship which I had with those clay trucks was a difficult one. You had to mend it, do something about it. But do something about it in a kind and compassionate way. Our usual problem is when we have a problem person or a problem situation, too often, instead of using loving kindness, which is incredibly powerful, too often we use anger. And that anger never works. I've never seen anger really work. It, it gives temporary solutions. You maybe force someone to back off, but really they just go and hurt somebody else. <coughs> or they go and sort of come back and harm you later on. Because all anger does, it creates fear in the other person. And when that fear disappears, or they get stronger, then they come and do the same old things again. So anger never really works. I'm, I remember once there was a, a nun in our monastery in Thailand, years and years ago, and she had looked like a psychological problem. She was getting anorexic. They're thinner and thinner and thinner. We were just really concerned about her. And whatever we said, she said, no, she was fasting because it's good for her meditation. Or no, she felt healthy, but to look at her, she was skin and bones. And of course, you know, we were responsible. If, you know, if, if, you know, I don't have that problem, obviously, but if any monk had a problem like that, you know, I'd be responsible for them. I have to do something to make sure they're okay. So, but whatever we did as monks, you know, she just would not listen. We had a senior monk came over from England. And we said, <coughs> he said to him, look, we, we haven't been able to do anything. Okay. <coughs> can you help? So he brought the nun to her. And this was a very great monk. And he was such a kind monk. He looked at her and he started shouting at her and scolding her. And I thought, my goodness, this monk who I really respected is getting angry. And I've never seen him angry like that, ever. I thought, what's going on? 
and he was shouting and scolding her and all sorts of stuff and then afterwards you know she went away and as soon as she went away that's when he changed his demeanor and he smiled and said that told her didn't it <laughs> he was acting it out and so I was actually quite relieved that Mike hadn't got angry he was a good actor he'd actually tried to use that as a skillful means he really was out of compassion but it didn't work even if you try, you think you're just, and this was a very good monk, you know, he had enough mindfulness and control. <coughs> when he played at being angry, he didn't become angry. He could do it, but still it never worked. But all the times which I've seen monks trying to scold their disciples, or see men scolding their wife, or wife scolding their husband, oh, it doesn't really work. The whole relationship loses its loses its love, loses its kindness, loses the glue which will bind you together. You feel so much remorse, so much unhappiness. It's not really worth doing. However, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, and I'm going to re, uh, um, repeat this now, because this is a very powerful thing. If ever in your relationship someone shouts and scolds at you, when they're finished, remember the 15 seconds of silence, after they finishing shouting at you. Don't say anything back. Certainly don't shout back. When they finish, the, finish their shouting and scolding, you look at them and keep quiet for 15 seconds. Giving them time to hear what they've just said. To reflect on the anger which they poured out at you. Because if people have that opportunity to listen to what they've just said, and you do that if you've given the 15 seconds of silence after someone's been shouting or scolding at you, if you give the other person that opportunity, they will learn what a stupid thing that was to shout and to scold. <coughs> so, it's other ways of dealing with the problems relationship. We do have to put boundaries on people. We can be firm. Well, you may have heard me, I was just uh, talking with Chi Wei about our builder. We're building a, a retreat centre. And the retreat centre is supposed to be finished by April, for the first meditation retreat. And we're looking at the builder, he's going really slow. So we've been quite firm with him. <coughs> so as a monk I don't say, oh builder, out of compassion and courage, you just take your time. If it's not finished for the retreat, never mind. I don't want you to have, have a headache. You just do it as slow as you want. That would be really stupid, wouldn't it? Because you know what Australian builders are like. So instead of doing things like that, you have to be quite firm, but it's compassionate, just keeping the relationship with loving kindness. So your intention, intention is to keep the relationship good, firm, mutual respect, so you can get things done. You do have to put boundaries, that's compassion with wisdom. If you have that compassion with wisdom, then it's not just being compassionate to the builder, it's being compassionate to me, it's being compassionate to all those people who are going to come on that first retreat. So sometimes we do have to put boundaries. Just like many sort of uh, Buddhists who work, who are managers, or even CEOs, or supervisors, sometimes they find it hard to tell people off at work. You may have someone working for you who's not doing the job. <coughs> An example, you've got a troubled employee. What do you do about that? And you've heard this before, but it comes up in this talk. If you have a troubled employee, then you use what we call the sandwich method. You go up to them as soon as possible, because if you let these things fester, they get worse and worse. So you get up to, up to the person, and the first thing you do is to give them some loving kindness, some praise. Just tell them how much you appreciate them working here. What a fun person they are to be here. 
or find something which you can respect in that person and let them know it because as soon as you do that people start to listen to you they open their ears and their mind because they want to listen to more and once their ears are fully open and a channel into their mind is fully open then you hit them with it because <laughs> otherwise if you go up to someone and say you know you put your facial features your body language you stupid um, employee you just don't know how to do things you're hopeless I don't know why I employed you a complete loser terrible now of course people might have said that to you do you listen to that? does anything go in? straight away whenever there's criticism a big barrier comes up in front of you you defend yourself you think to yourself what's he saying that to me I'm not stupid I'm a good worker you just don't listen anymore there's not a way to communicate so by praising the other person they're listening to you and they also realize that you have meta towards them you have loving kindness you care about them and what a wonderful thing it is to know that someone actually cares about you and if as a boss you care about your employees you're also caring about your company this is an important thing to be able to do if the employees know you're caring about them they'll be more willing number one to listen and then number two to take the advice and to maybe alter so after the place you give them the criticism but in a kind voice <coughs> you're coming in too late well you know you can't do the job properly and then you find out some strategies together because it is never your employee's problem if you're the manager it's your problem as well because you know your ma big manager might sort of sack you not because you haven't done the job because your employees haven't done the job so we're all in this boat together so it's always our problem so we try and find strategies these are the boundaries which you mean for, by um, kindness and compassion are you in the wrong job? can we get you another job? do you need more training? You know, is there something else we can do? have you got any emotional problems at home which is causing you not to perform well at work? what can we do to help you? so when you're in it together, you've worked together to find a solution so this problem employee or this problem person you talk it's amazing where you can find out you know, where you actually understand where a person is coming from and then afterwards to complete the sandwich method so you can actually leave on friendly terms you finish with a bit of praise but you know, please remember we really value you, you're a good friend, I really like you because that leaves with a person wanting to maintain that friendship wanting to actually to work hard and change themselves to please someone who's being kind to them that's actually how we use compassion in business and that's how you can, <coughs> can use compassion in the world especially to problem people find out what the problem is first of all I recall one of my old school friends he became a teacher a school teacher and he chose one of the worst schools in the whole of England it was in Wandsworth Wandsworth Comprehensive School I think it was actually I shouldn't say it's the worst school because the teachers are very motivated they had some tough kids in that school that was the suburb of London next to uh, Brixton and at that time they had the big Brixton riots in the south of London so they had some very tough kids in this school and he told the story once that you know, his class of kids came into the classroom one day and one of the kids spat on his feet, on his shoes actually not on his shoes, just in, on the floor, just in front just so they're walking in so he was quite firm, he said clean that up and the kids said F off and what would you do as a teacher you know, if somebody did that and swore at you so he said go straight to the, the deputy principal who was a disciplinarian so he said the kid to the deputy principal a few about half an hour an hour later a deputy principal came into the classroom with, with his arm around this boy the deputy principal had time to find out what was happening with this kid and found out the night before so the father 
had viciously beaten his mother and she was hospitalized. The police had been around, the whole family had been separated and here was like a young 11 or 12 year old who probably hardly slept that night who just witnessed his father and mother who he depended upon the mother he loved dearly just viciously beaten and sent to hospital and he said now you understand why he did that sometimes if we take the time, if we can take the time to understand why a person acts in these ways we don't feel like we should get angry anymore. So as an 11 year old, if that ever happened to me, well, I might probably would do something worse. Just out of the sheer confusion, an 11 year old doesn't know how to ask for help instead of accepting these really strange, violent ways, at least some 11 year olds. So when we understand where a person's coming from, are they really a troubled person? Should we just cut them off? There's one. <coughs> wonderful if we can have time to actually to ask them what's happening, where's it coming from, what's really upsetting you. Unfortunately our society these days that you know, we're so busy and I'm busy person number one probably that sometimes we don't have enough time for each other which is unfortunate. But at least we can understand that some of the reason why a person is troubled or causing us troubled it's not as something permanently wrong with them, that they've been born in a state where they're always going to be like this. There's some causes and reasons for this. So understanding this, you know, we can have some kindness, we can have some compassion, and if possible, some understanding of where they're coming from. Because many of us haven't got that time, we haven't got that wisdom, sometimes again, out of compassion, we have to draw a boundary. <coughs> sometimes, you know, we have to call the police. That sort of teacher had to send that boy to the principal. You know, we have to sort of move away you know, to protect ourselves and protect people. We do have to have prisons. As I keep on saying here, the prison should never be for punishment. It should always be for rehabilitation. Because well, I don't believe in punishment. I don't think it really works. The only time which I think, the only thing which happens with punishment is people make sure they don't get caught next time. And they feel somehow now they want to take revenge on the people who punish them. Instead of punishment, learning, rehabilitation, understanding why we can't do these things, understanding the importance of relationships. It's not just about me. I think many people have been hurt in life because of them, just like that kid having a family which is very violent, probably violent to him as well, goes straight inside oneself and thinks self-preservation is number one. You have to preserve yourself because all the people they trusted let them down violently. And such people sometimes they are so self-protective they can't have a relationship with other people except with violence or they are the problem people. It's wonderful if we can find some way of, of drawing them out and giving them a life. As over the years you do collect some stories of people who were born on the wrong side of the tracks who make it in life. And one of the stories which I read, uh, I think it was in a prison book, there's an amazing story. I don't know if it's got much to do with this talk, but it's one of those inspirational stories which shows no matter how down you are, you never know what's around the corner and how your life can totally change. It's about this young, uh, no it's not young, this career criminal in Los Angeles in and out of jails ever since he was a child because he ran away from home when he was six years of age. Violent mother and father or not really a, a father but just many men <coughs> and always being abused and beaten and not properly fed. So as a six year old he ran away and lived on the streets of Los Angeles just living out and just gathering food from wherever he could, mostly by stealing. Being a six-year-old, he could get away with a few things. But that was his life. He'd get caught sometimes and put into juvenile centers, but because he had no family, it started with petty crime and then just went up the ladder to more major crimes later on. He had no chance. 
but he said when well, he was about a third, about 40 year old crim sort of in one of the big jails in California for a, a crime but he was soon to be paroled and that was when he had a case officer who was trying to make sure that they found him a job, got some work so <coughs> he wouldn't need to reoffend. But now how can you get a job for a career criminal? Because who would want to employ someone who is a thief, violent and got sort of a history of crime just stretching back to when he was six? It's almost unemployable. But his karma must have been about to ripen because this case officer, this young uh, girl, knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who worked in Hollywood. And they were about to produce a movie, a gangster movie, and they wanted the movie to be authentic. Not just like Hollywood gangsters, but real gangsters. He was about to be paroled, so she went to the friend of the friend of the friend and said, look, I've got this guy, he's about to be paroled soon, and he's the expert. He's like you know, a criminal consultant, because he is one, been all his life. So the director actually hired him as a consultant for the scriptwriters, so that the language used in this movie could be authentic. And when the director saw him, not only was the way, sort of, his language, but the way he moved, he looked like a criminal. So they gave him a part in the movie. And the, the director was called Quentin Tarantino, and the movie was called Reservoir Dogs, which was the movie which made Quentin Tarantino's name. And this guy went straight out of jail, unemployable, to act in a movie, and just with that one movie, he could buy a mansion, I think in Beverly Hills, <laughs> and retire for the rest of the life. And he actually married his caseworker. So he turned from a career criminal <laughs> into sort of a movie star. And I, I, ha I haven't seen that movie, you don't watch movies, but people say that of those criminals in the gang, he's the one who really stands out there's another tough guy, the authentic guy, because he was a criminal. He knew what, how it worked. So there's actually a case where a person was, was really having a terrible time in his life. Everything was stacked against him. And sometimes we understand why these things happen, why people are troubled. Maybe you can actually give them a bit of slack. Obviously protect yourself, protect them, but for rehabilitate, and all of the things which you learn in life, you can always make, make use of them. <coughs> There's that famous story I say, you've heard many times, when you go home and you tread in the dog shit, you never scrape it off your shoes until you get home. Because when you get home, you, then you take off your shoes, you scrape off the dog shit under your mango tree or apple tree. You dig it in. And one year later, your mangoes or apples will be sweeter than ever before because of the dog shit. But when you eat that mango, so juicy, so sweet, <coughs> you must always remember what you're really eating. <coughs> it is, it's dog shit you're eating. <coughs> it's amazing how you can transform the most disgusting and smelliest of things into the most juiciest of fruits. So that's why the problems a person has, if they know how to use them, they can become just amazing qualities which people have in life. <coughs> That's why, instead of punishing people, I like to rehabilitate and exploit. Exploit the skills which people develop. They're troublesome because they don't know how to use those qualities. <coughs> or use their experience in life, use their wisdom. So I think all the things which happen to you in life, you can make use of, even the most unpleasant things can sometimes be the best ingredients for your wisdom, compassion and understanding about life. So if you do see a trouble, <coughs> a troubled person, that can be something which, if you have the time and the skill to bring out in them, can transform to something amazing and wonderful. 
inside of them. It just needs to be transformed and encouraged and turned from something, a power which is negative to a power which is positive. And of course I think that's the most wonderful thing about loving kindness. You can actually maybe do that. Because with that kindness, <coughs> instead of a person retreating into themselves and just defending themselves at all costs, which is usually what problem people do, they're so scared of relaxing and letting go and actually being with you, they just don't know how to make proper relationships. A bit of kindness from somebody else, a bit of respect from somebody else, may allow them to open up and to be a friend. And then the problems will just vanish. In so many cases of people who were problems, and they found a good friend, somebody who did trust them, and they lived up to that trust. There's a, a story which, if ever I write a sequel to Opening the Door of Your Heart, will appear in that, and it's a story of the monk and the thief. Once there was a monk, a Buddhist monk, and up at the temple, <coughs> early one morning, he was woken up by a sound in the, in the main hall. It wasn't a monk's chanting, because they don't get up that early. And so he got up early himself, went into the hall, he saw a burglar. And the burglar was trying to open up the donation box. You now with a knife. And as soon as the burglar saw the monk, he threatened the monk with a knife. Get out of here or I'll kill you. And all the monk said, Sir, if you want to open up the donation box, here are the keys. And he gave the keys of the donation box to this burglar. He said, I can see you're probably very hungry too. If you just look above that box, there's a cupboard. No tricks! Just above there, there's a leftover from this morning's food. Take something and eat. And the burglar, sort of half looking at the monk to make sure there's no trick, because he really was hungry, managed to open the top cupboard. And there was some food there, and he grabbed a couple of sandwiches, shoved some in his mouth and some in his pocket. And he opened up the donation box with the key, shoved the money in his pocket, and again, waved the knife at the monk. If you tell the police, I'll come back and kill you. And the monk said, it's a donation box. Maybe it's good for poor people like you. Take it and go. I'll give it to you. And so the burglar ran away. And the monk never did tell the police, although he had a lot of explaining to do to the treasurer of his committee. <laughs> it was not that much money anyway. A few days later, what usually happens, burglar robbing another house, he got caught and sent to jail for many years. After he was released from jail, he turned up at the temple again, early in the morning. He got out the knife again, and he threatened the abbot. Remember me? I robbed your temple five years ago. And the abbot said, oh yeah, I remember you. I've come to rob your temple again. <laughs> Isn't that what happens when you give too much metta? You're a pushover and people take advantage of you? But that's not what he meant. He's, the burglar said, last time I came here, I stole the wrong thing. I've been thinking about you all the time I'm in jail. You're the only person who was kind to me. I realize I've stolen the wrong thing. Now I've come to steal your secret of kindness. You put the knife away. Please make me your disciple. And he became a monk to learn what compassion and kindness and wisdom truly is. First time he stole the wrong thing, now he came to steal what was really important, kindness, compassion and wisdom. What would you rather have? A bag full of money or the secret of kindness? So there's a lovely little story there about what's really worth taking from a monastery. Not the donations in the box, but the kindness and wisdom of people who know 
what's most important in life. And now as a troubled man, became at peace with himself. So often in life you do need these, these circuit breakers, so the troubled people can actually see what they're doing and see another way in life. And sometimes our kindness and compassion can maybe generate that circuit breaker so you can do things in a different way. One of the other great ways of circuit breaking with, with uh, kindness is again with forgiveness. Forgiveness is <coughs> such a powerful thing. Two weeks ago I mentioned many cases of forgiveness. If a person has done a bad act to you, a really bad act, and you go and forgive them, really forgive them from the heart, sometimes that can change their whole life. The very fact that somebody has forgiven what was almost unforgivable, just it's a circuit breaker because it almost they can't comprehend why you can do that. To be able to do that is an amazing thing. And when it happens, it changes the way people do things. I gave a talk maybe a year or two ago in Curtin University as part of the human, uh, human rights course, Human Rights and Religion. And one of the students at that human rights course was that, I think it's Dennis Eggington. He's now the head of the Aboriginal uh, Legal, what's it called? Aboriginal Legal Support Group, whatever. Sorry? Service. Aboriginal Legal Service, yeah. <coughs> I often see him in the paper. And during my talk he said, it's amazing what you've just been talking about, because he had an experience a couple of weeks before. <coughs> a couple of drunk drivers had rammed into a car containing two Aboriginal boys and killed them. And these two Aboriginal boys are really good students, they're not getting into sort of any sort of trouble at all, doing really well at school, very promising, they're really, really good guys, they're the cream of the crop, and they've been killed by these stupid drunk drivers. Problem was, the drunk drivers were also Aboriginal. And at the funeral service, because it was all Nungas, everybody had to be there. The two drivers were in custody, but the father and other relations of those two drivers had to attend the funeral ceremony, together with the relations of the two boys who had died. Nyunga custom meant there had to be payback. And payback means if you can't give payback to the people who killed your children, to the closest relations. So the whole crematorium, I think it was in Calcutta, I think he said, was so tense because no one knew when payback would happen. In the middle of the service, the father of one of the boys who had died got up and before there was a police there, before the police could stop him, went for the father of one of the murderers, one of the boys who had killed his son, went for him, hugged him and said, I forgive, no payback. He broke him the custom, but everybody was so impressed, even though he was quite young, at that time they made him an elder. A person who was wise, who gained the respect of the whole community. It's amazing just what the power of forgiveness can do. It can change a whole custom. And change so much problems in our world to do something like that. So, even though it might be an age-old custom to have payback, there was a person who said, no, I'm going to forgive and end all this cycle of violence. So problem people, forgiveness, that type of compassion is an amazing way of changing the cycle of problems. Because <coughs> the difficulty is, yeah we've got a problem person there, so if you put a boundary around them, or put them in jail, or just move away from them, is that really the end of the problem? Is there going to be another problem afterwards? <coughs> so with loving kindness, compassion and wisdom, we don't seek just for short-term solutions. 
We want a long-term solution. A solution which is going to last in our world. How we can deal with problem people and problem things. Before I run out of time, the problems in life. How do you deal with problems in life? Do you just run away from it? Or just suppress it with anger, with force? Go and get drunk or just run away to a cave or a monastery or somewhere? There's no way to run away from problems. Problems in our life. We use loving kindness to embrace it. Embracing it means we bring it close enough together to really understand it. It may be a sickness, it may be a cancer, it may be a, you're dying or someone else is dying. When you embrace it and bring it close to you, you can actually understand it. When you're running away, your face is turned in the opposite direction. When you embrace someone, you're actually looking at them face to face. When you're running, you can't see them because they're behind you. When you embrace, you see. And when you see, you may be able to understand. When you may be able to understand, you may be able to appreciate the problem it was not the thing itself, the cancer, the death, but just the way we relate to such things. It's part of my job as a monk to take away the stigma of death. There's nothing wrong with dying. It's okay to die. So if someone dies, you say, oh, I'm terribly sorry. So you're glad. Well, wow, wonderful, they're dead. They get a nice new life again. <coughs> Again, now they're really so sick and so old and ugly and falling apart. You know, do you say that maybe you know, you've you've got rid of your old car and you've got a new car? Do you ever say, you know, someone comes along and said, "I've just bought a new car today," and they got rid of their old car? You don't say, oh, "I'm terribly sorry, your old car has has gone to the sort of wreckage yard." No one says, "Oh, you're delighted, you got a new car. Well done, that's a nice model." So isn't that the same as dying? So you get a new model. So wonderful. So you don't have to worry about the old car anymore. The old bomb of a body, which many of you got. My body's getting to be a bit of a bomb now. <coughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so, and getting sick. What's wrong with being sick? You learn so much from these things. That gentleman always told me, learn from the so-called problems of life. They're your teachers. And that's perhaps the most important point of this talk. If it's a problem person, or a problem in your life, or a problem in your health, these are our teachers. This is what we really learn from. We learn compassion from facing up to those problems. We learn that inner strength. We learn that this too will pass. <coughs> that problem person won't always be there. The sickness won't always be there. Certainly death, it goes pretty quickly, only a few seconds and it's all over. Whatever it is, you know it's not always going to last. Which gives you the, the wisdom, which produces the strength just to be with it as it's visiting you. So you can actually learn from it. And we learn so much from these things. We learn just <coughs> how to be at peace with the problems in life. When those problems aren't learnt there, how to appreciate the times in life when there are very few problems. We don't take life for granted. In other words, when you haven't got problems with your health, you don't, you don't take those non-sick moments for granted. When your economy is going well, you don't take the good times for granted. That's one of the main reasons we're in economic problems. Too many people took those good times for granted. Obviously, thinking they're going to last forever. And probably many of you did that too. You should know as Buddhists, boom times are also impermanent. And each other, they're going to pass, you know that. So you should have sort of squirreled some money away. Not in banks, because they really pass, but you know, in sort of safety deposits or I don't know where. The best place to actually to invest your money, squirrel it away, is in a good karma box. <laughs> Donations to monasteries. Because good karma, the good karma stock market never crashes. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how much uh, you put in the bank, that can disappear very quickly. But your karma is there forever for you. So this way that we can learn how to deal with the problems in life. To understand them. To learn from them. To grow from them. 
and the problems also tend to disappear and grow as well. And that way that when we see someone, if we have got the energy, the time and the spiritual strength, they're not a problem anymore. <coughs> they're a teacher. So that we can learn from. As we learn from them, it's a two-way street, they also learn. And that person grows, and we grow as well. That's the whole purpose of life, is growing in our knowledge, in our wisdom, in our kindness, in our spiritual strengths. And problems are what help us. So that's a little talk this evening. Oh, it's supposed to be about dealing with problems in life. I think it's pretty much dealing with problems, with metta, with loving kindness, but also with wisdom. So hopefully that answered the question in one way or another. Thank you for listening.